Some people find it hard to park in London, but not this guy. Uh, Hugo Spowers of Rival Simper River Simple Cars. You, you said to me this car is an electric vehicle without a battery. What on earth does that mean? Yes, so it's, uh, it's got electric motors in all four wheels. Uh, it runs entirely electrically, it's zero emissions, but we have no batteries at all on the car. And all the energy is stored in hydrogen, which passes through a fuel cell, creating electricity on demand. Um, but you told me also there's something interesting about the uh, hydrogen fuel cell in this vehicle, something a bit different. Yes, well, it's really the architecture of the car that's different. So the fuel cell actually is um, from forklift. It's only an eight and a half kilowatt fuel cell. It can not quite power three domestic kettles. And, and it's made for forklifts for Walmart warehouses. And the, the different thing is the way in which we built the hydrogen car. So uh, most of the major motor manufacturers have got hydrogen fuel cell programs. But they're trying to squeeze fuel cells into conventional cars and get them to behave like petrol engines, which they really don't do very well. Uh, whereas we've had the, the only advantage of being a startup company is we've got a clean sheet of paper. So we've completely... Uh, revise the way in which you build a car. It's a completely different architecture, a new pattern of relationships. And so the fuel cell provides the uh, electricity for the motors. They then are also the brakes, and they charge a bank of capacitors. Uh, when when the, uh, that's regen braking, the Toyota Prius and lots of other cars have regen braking. What does that mean, regen? We talk about regenerative as part of the Alma Carta Foundation. Yes. Regenerative braking, what on earth is it? It's a matter of recovering the energy and storing it for later reuse. And the Toyota Prius, for instance, has regen braking. The most you'll ever get back into the battery is about 10% of the kinetic energy of the car. We can get over 50% of the energy back into the capacitors. And that means that we can rely on the capacitors for three quarters of the power re uh, required when you're accelerating. And the fuel cell can then only, then can be a very small fuel cell, that size simply for the maximum constant speed. Uh, I'm nodding and I'm pretending I'm understanding most of what you're saying. <laughs> but I think uh, the thing that's really fascinating for me about this vehicle isn't necessarily the technology, because I don't understand it. It's uh, the business model and the design. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So the model is designed to align interests with, between us as a company and the needs of society, the constraints of the planet, regulatory trends, and the interests of customers. We'll never sell a car. Uh, we will only ever sell a performance contract, a subscription service, rather like a mobile phone. So typically customers will sign up for a three-year contract, and it's got a fixed-priced element monthly, and a, and a mileage rate, like a usage rate on a mobile phone. And that is the only transaction you have in having access to the car. You don't have to haggle with the insurance company because it's included. Right. When you fill up with fuel, you don't pay. We do. And it completely changes uh, the car that we design. It affects every aspect of the business, to be honest. But that's, that's not untypical because actually most cars on the road are on a sort of higher purchase or a leasing arrangement anyway. You, what was it, 90% you told me before? Yes. Uh, I mean, leasing we avoid as a term, like the plague, because people think they understand what it means. And, uh, and quite frankly, leasing is a mechanism to persuade people to buy a car when they can't really afford it and don't need it. And it's a mechanism to keep on churning product out of the factory gates in a sale of product model. In our case, I think the two principles, uh, which I think, I think are the two principles to really get the maximum economic and environmental benefit out of circularizing your business, are one that the, the product stays on our balance sheet from a clean sheet of paper when we design it right the way through to end of life. And secondly, we internalize all operating costs on that same P&L. So it covers everything. It is the only transaction you have, and you know exactly what your cost of motoring is going to be um, if you know what mileage you're going to do, 10,000 miles a year, and you can work out the, the price, even with a second-hand car. So if you take a 10-year-old car from us, it will still be as reliable as a new one, otherwise we wouldn't supply it to you. It has no moving parts other than the wheels, and all the structural materials are inert. Steering wheel, surely. Right? Yes, no high speed of moving parts. The pedals move as well. Okay, so you said perhaps this is 10 years uh, this car would last for, or is it longer? How, how many users do you think would uh, uh, we, use the... We model over a 15-year economic life because the average car life is 13 and a half in the UK. 
Um, sadly, it's been 13 and a half for the last four decades. And it used to be corrosion that took cars off the road. It's now black boxes failing. Um, however, we believe that we'll get a much longer revenue stream out of this. This is not a product we're building to sell. It's a revenue generating asset that sits on our balance sheet. So instead of obsolescence, our interest is longevity. Instead of high running costs, our interests are low running costs. It gives us a direct incentive to improve efficiency, improve efficiency because we're paying for the fuel for the life of the car. So it's worth investing in efficiency. That's that alignment of incentives, incentive for you to Absolutely. keep the cost down, make it efficient. Yes. Um, let's have a big woo moment amongst the audience. Pop open this door. It's a lovely mechanism here. Look at this. How about that, people? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the cost of producing this uh, car, Hugo, because there's an interesting story behind that as well, isn't there? Yes. I mean, these ones, we are building a, uh, our first production run of 20 vehicles going into a beta trial, but um, <clears throat> in volume production, they'll be an awful lot cheaper to build than, than they are at the moment. However, because this is a revenue-generating asset on our balance sheet, the price that we charge in the marketplace for a profitable business is not governed by the build cost of the car. If you sell cars, it doesn't matter what technology it is, if you're trying to move away from combustion engines to batteries or hydrogen or anything, it's low volume, supply chain costs are much higher, and, you, and all, car, all new zero emission cars are, carry a premium in the marketplace. In our case, though, we're never selling the car. So we're competing on the basis of lifetime cost, not build cost. And that includes the, all the operating cost and the end of life. The industry regards that as a 200 euro liability, but because we know the car's going to be ours when we start designing it, right through to end of life, we design that to, for maximum recovery of value. It becomes a credit on our, uh, on our balance sheet. Also, we design it to minimize those operating costs because we're paying them, and to lengthen that revenue stream because it's a revenue generating asset. So those three things, longer revenue streams, lower operating costs, and higher value recovery, offset a higher build cost, allowing us to come to market at no premium over a conventional car, despite the fact that our costs, supply chain costs, are still much higher. Uh, and the cost to the customer on a sort of monthly basis is around 500 pounds a month. How does that compare with the mm. higher purchase? We're talking about uh, indicatively 370 pounds a month and 18p a mile. If you do 10,000 miles a year, uh, that works out about 500 a month, uh, pounds a month. And we're benchmarking against the total cost of ownership of a bottom of the range diesel Golf. Now, people tend to think only of the 225 pounds a month they pay in their PCP. But in fact, if you look at the total costs for the first three years of ownership of a bottom of the range diesel Golf, Depending on whether you buy it for a PCP or a lease or whatever, it varies between 490 and 550 pounds a month. So we're aiming to match that cost of ownership. Of course, we're not used to bundling costs together. Mm -hmm. And we all collude, really, with the industry, not knowing how much our cars really cost us. Um, but we think, and so one of our big challenges is explaining to people that this is an equivalent cost of ownership. We want to take price off the table as a reason to take or not take one of our cars. There's another challenge, though. It's around the fact you use hydrogen, and uh, hydrogen fuel cells are... There aren't many state terminals in the UK mm. where one could refill this car. Mm. Tell us a bit about that challenge and how you might overcome it. Well, I think this is one area where we feel that there hasn't been enough thought put into the transition strategy. Any disruptive technology always has to come into market at, in a niche below the radar where, where the weaknesses don't matter and the key weakness is infrastructure. And it's all very well like Toyota are doing and Hyundai and it's brilliant cars they're producing. But they're, they're intercity capable motorway limos and, and you need 300 filling stations. And they're saying, well, poor little us, we can't afford 300 filling stations. So um, we are targeting this specifically at local vehicle use. There's somewhere between three and five million cars that never go outside a 25 mile radius. That's the market we're targeting. And uh, if you put in one, if you put in, if you, that's the market you're after, you bring your critical scale of infrastructure down from 300 to just one filling station, and it creates a commercial market. It's a small market, but it's commercially viable. You put in a filling station somewhere like Oxford, and we put in 50 cars. Anybody in that area who has a reason to come into Oxford once a week is a potential customer. Mm. 
And by concentrating the market, there's a business case for investing in that one filling station that's independent of the 300 others you need. And you can expand the market one filling station at a time and develop the skeleton of a nationwide network without ever taking that nationwide gamble. And as that one filling station gets busy, there's an economic case for another one and so on and so forth. Absolutely. I think we've got time for one final question uh, around your supply chain because you wanted to build in circular principles through the supply chain too. Tell Absolutely. us about that. Uh, as I said, aligning interests, we want to align interests with our suppliers. If you buy components, you want to buy at as cheap a price as possible, as long a life as possible. And the supplier wants as high a price as possible, as short a life as possible. So the relationship between the supply chain and the auto manufacturers is not great. Um, however, we want to actually pay for the service of the components. We never want to buy fuel cells. We want to pay fuel cell suppliers for the, the kilowatt hours of electricity pay for the time we have the fuel cell, the time it's running, and pay them a premium for the efficiency with which hydrogens convert into electricity. We want them to do the same with the membranes in the fuel cell of people like Johnson Matthey who make membranes. And we want Johnson Matthey not to buy platinum from Anglo-American who mine platinum, but to lease the, the, the platinum. And by doing this, it aligns the interests of all the players in that system. You can draw an envelope around the 15-year life of the fuel cell, of the car, and you have a shared interest in what is the cheapest way of delivering that service.